You know, I said, what's this Bly going around talking about the wild man, you know, trying to get these men to get in touch with their wild man. Well, what is that all about? Well, and, and, and to top it off, he's not just talking about getting in touch with your wild man. He's always saying to groups of men, you know, <clears throat> a man is supposed to be getting into trouble. And so more specifically, what he's really getting at and what he comes out of so beautifully so much of the time is this, is this lover energy. And it does not respect boundaries. It's one of the things that you got to get real clear about. Remember, you got to study this archetypal stuff because archetypes aren't nice. None of them are nice. And they're not balanced. In this lecture about the lover archetype and its influence on the psyche within masculine psychology, Dr. Robert Moore emphasizes the need to consciously engage with the lover energy to prevent it from contaminating other aspects of the psyche. Join us as Dr. Robert Moore goes deep into the structures of masculine psychology, revealing the positive and negative sides of the lover within each and every man. For about the last 15 years, I've been working on trying to get some sense of the uh, deep structures of the masculine psyche and uh, working on trying to understand the configurations of potential that are within the human self. And I've been working on uh, uh, trying to lay this out in some schema that is understandable and which people can see the way in which these potentials interact and mutually support each other in a maturing uh, male psyche. Now, as you know, in Jungian psychology, we see masculine and feminine in the, in the psyche balanced in the deep self. And I've talked about how Jung imaged that in the... Uh, can you hear me back there? Uh, imaged that in the image of the sacred marriage, or the hieros gamas. Well, in, uh, in the introduction to this and other places, I have gone into the way in which I believe the, uh, when you decode the structure, the archetypal structure of the psyche, you see there are four couples within. A king and queen with their own particular space that they generate, which is a just order which is a hospitable order which makes room for and empowers all of the royal family that emerges between them. If you study mythology, you'll see this image everywhere, uh, from Native American to Hindu culture to others. Of course, you don't see it in patriarchy. In patriarchy, uh, you get, you get this idea that a lonely God is better than one that is not lonely. Kind of a weird idea. It's amazing how it's lasted so long. Uh, but, any, <clears throat> but anyway, uh, then there's a warrior couple, uh, which is in the space of struggle. To the extent that one is living in the warrior space, and many of us workaholic types are, you know, we call it just being serious about our careers, but uh, it's really a kind of pathology, a kind of sickness. I'm going to get into that some tonight. Uh, we'll get into it even more next week. But, uh, but it is, it, it, everything is struggle. Everything is action. If you're really good at this warrior business, your motto is the same as George Patton's. Attack, attack, attack. That's that energy. And uh, it has a lot of very important contributions to the psyche and to human culture, and uh, it does not deserve the slandering and misunderstanding that that particular configuration has received. Um, then there is the magician couple, known in the occult as the priest and the priestess. And if you want to see this acted out, find a neo-pagan group, of which there are many. 
here and around the country and, and go to one of their rituals and you'll see the, the priest and priestess act this archetypal pattern out. And they are the stewards of transformative space, what Victor Turner called liminality, uh, the space of death and rebirth, which is a space that we need. This is the archetypal configuration of going inward and becoming aware of waking up. The whole philosophy of Gurdjieff was based on waking up. And so the archetype of the magician in men and women is, is that archetype of, of waking up, coming to. Uh, and when he came to himself, he, you know, it's the, it's the image of doing away with enchantment, getting, breaking the spell, the enchanted enclosure of consciousness. Uh, but in this course, we're dealing with, uh, with the lover couple. Uh, and this couple tends to be uh, heavily in the shadow in Judeo-Christian uh, Islamic uh, culture, but it's, but it's in the shadow very, in a very widespread way throughout human experience. Uh, it is very difficult to integrate this potential into life. It's very slippery. It tends to slip out. It tends to move across boundaries. You, it's hard, to, well, as we will get into it in a minute, you can't domesticate this at all. It's hard to domesticate any of these. You can't really domesticate any archetypal energies, but this one, uh, uh, this scares people. Uh, and, uh, and yet... Uh, as we'll see later this evening, it, uh, tonight I'm not going to talk about its shadow side. I'm going to be an advocate for this energy tonight. Next week, uh, we will be dealing with the shadow side. I started out with thinking about the uh, structure of the psyche, uh, thinking about some of the expressions in uh, myth and in folklore, of which there are many. You could have a multi-session, uh, you could have many courses just on the, the mythology of the lover. Read Joseph Campbell's Creative Mythology to get at uh, the mythology of the lover. Uh, but next week we'll look at the pathology of the lover, or the sort of the boy lover. And, uh, and then the final session, we'll talk about ways to heal and, uh, and connect with, access this energy in a way that uh, can uh, feed your life and, uh, and uh, give you the kind of qualities and potentials that we'll be talking about tonight. So tonight, uh, tonight, we're not going to try to give a balanced treatment of anything. We're going to try to represent, try to talk about this energy, what it's in there for what it does and what it's for, and why you dare not ignore this energy, uh, not just because if you ignore it, it will sneak up on you and come at you from the back door and, and through the shadow, but, uh, but for the things which it has to offer uh, a human being in life. So let me, let me get started here uh, and just... Just begin by, we really should have dedicated this whole class to Robert Bly because he's carrying the, the lover for men around all over everywhere today, you know. I mean, people project, men that have trouble with this aspect of their personality tend to project this on the poets and on the writers and on the artists and so forth. And then one of the things that's hard about being a po poet or an artist or a musician is because people are so ready to dump this on you and expect you to carry it for them. And it tends to make you a little crazy. And we'll see why. But, but it, this is really, as I said, uh, not in jest last week. This is the archetype of drugs, sex, and rock and roll. And it's not just the archetype of, uh, of refined music and uh, sublime poetry and all of these things. This is, uh, you get a sense of the energy of this thing when you get uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of volume and a lot of passion and a lot of bass guitar. 
In fact, uh, in fact, it's really kind of sacrilegious in terms of the God and goddess of love for us not to have some hell-raising music to start this off. I tried again, you know, but we couldn't, we couldn't get that. You know, some of these Apollonian deities are interfering. But, uh, but anyway, <laughs> we, we'll see. Next week, we're gonna, you, you can come as your shadow lover next week, and we'll see, what, see how many of you got the guts to do that. But uh, Robert Bly is always talking about, uh, in his inimitable way, I'm going to try, Robert, I'm going to try to imitate you one of these days when I get the courage up. Uh, I'm still practicing my Norwegian. But... <laughs> Oh, there you go, okay. <laughs> he can do it better. But Bly's talking about the wild man. He's always talking, this disturbs people, you know. They say, what's this Bly going around talking about the wild man, you know, trying to get these men to get in touch with their wild man. Well, what is that all about? <laughs> well, and, and, and to top it off, he's not just talking about getting in touch with your wild man. He's always saying to groups of men, you know, <clears throat> a man is supposed to be getting into trouble. I was about to think about that. He said, if you're not getting into trouble, something's wrong. Well, now, you, got, you see, you're going to have to get a feeling for this archetype if you're going to get a sense for what he's talking about. Now, I like to kind of clean it up. You know, I try to, I try to, you know, I try to say, well, Robert really, uh, Robert doesn't really mean that. He really is talking about the archetypal self. And you know you can't domesticate the archetypal self, and that's and that's part right, you know. But but he really does mean if you if you're a man, you ought to be getting in a little trouble. And so, more specifically, what he's really getting at, and what he comes out of so beautifully, so much of the time, is this is this lover energy, and it does not respect boundaries. It's one of the things that you got to get real clear about. Remember. You got to study this archetypal stuff because archetypes aren't nice. None of them are nice. And they're not balanced. See? They are full and they press their case imperialistically. So, you know, that's why people tend to stay away from archetypes as much as they can, you know, and be bland and boring. Because, because if you get in touch with any of the archetypes, it tends to want to take over and possess you and use your body to do its thing. And this is not just true of the lover archetype, it's true of all of them. But uh, this particular energy, uh, one of its characteristics is it doesn't respect boundaries. And, you know, there's a lot of talk today about uh, about shame. Uh, there's a lot of interest in psychoanalysis now and in psychotherapy and family systems and all that sort of thing about shame. Well, shame, you know, they say that, well, so, such and such culture is a shame culture, but this culture is a guilt culture. But if you really know the truth of it, all cultures are shame cultures. That is, one of the ways they get control over you is by teaching you to be ashamed of yourself. Uh, teaching you to be ashamed first of your body and to be ashamed of your, especially of your enthusiasm. You want to be real careful about showing anybody your enthusiasm because if you do, uh, you're likely to get a very stiff what Freudians would call anal response. <laughs> you can feel that in your body, living, you know. <laughs> Tighten those fingers, folks. You know. Okay, but what you get in this archetype is you get a pressure toward shamelessness. The archetypal lover doesn't understand that shame crap. It's not into hiding. It's not into not being seen. It's not into being nice 
and not making anybody uncomfortable, see, with your body. See. The archetypal lover pushes you, and I get this, and you can, if you can watch your own bodily response to this, if you get in touch with it, it will push you from your shame reactions with other people to a to passionate play and display. Passionate play and display. That is, this is located in the area of your exhibitionism. You know, there's a lot of talk now about shy people. People who are shy. There's, you know, people are getting to be experts in shyness today, you know. Well, I just wrote a book on shyness. Well, they're talking about what the psychoanalysts have always talked about is capacity to be exhibitionistic. And one thing that I really love about the Freudian school of uh, psychoanalysis is that they understand that there is a healthy exhibitionism. And one of the things we'll talk about as we go tonight is the capacity to get to the place where you can stand and contain your healthy desire to display yourself to others. And I don't mean just in sexual contact, but your healthy desire to display yourself. Now, I want you to think about dancing in that context. We'll get to it in a little bit. But, but think about the role of dance in this, and you can think about it. Healthy, shameless display. And I want you to underestimate the, the power of a psyche that can do that. I want you to be thinking with me tonight about the strength of a personality, the capacity of a personality that can shamelessly display itself physically as well as otherwise. That is a, that is a potential that very few of us are capable of, of letting come out without the help of some substance or another. <laughs> okay, now in the archetypal tradition, I mentioned a little bit about this last week, they, they talk about this as, uh, they locate this in the space, the space of the lovers is the garden. And throughout world mythology, the garden symbolizes uh, the space where one doesn't have to work, worry about working. In other words, you leave the warrior at the gate. You don't worry about caring for others in some uh, responsible way. You know, oh my God, I got to be a good father or a good mother or a, you know, good whatever. Uh, that kind of sort of responsible caring is left out of the garden. You're not, in the garden, you're not making love to somebody, you know, sort of out of the goodness of your heart. Well, I know she needs this. <laughs> it's that time again. You know. Uh, so you, it, the getting into the garden is a, is a room in the psyche. It is a distinctive space. And, and one of the things we'll talk about uh, briefly, uh, the kind of what passes for sexual therapy today, uh, the last session. But the best things about those, those attempts to help people with their sexuality is the, the way in which they try to change the perception of space and time through various techniques, and we'll talk about that a little bit the last session. But all that stuff is, and they don't really understand it, they're trying to help people get out of a certain kind of space-time. You know, you want to get out of the space-time of the king and queen in their caring mode. Uh, Get out of the space-time of the warrior couple with their struggling mode against struggling against chaos. Get out of the space and time of the magician couple who has to understand everything and get it all right. 
you know, and to get into the space of the garden where one is into being sensuous and experiencing and not being in a hurry, not being aware of clock time in the same way that you are in other spaces of the psyche. So it is a, it is a distinctive space, a capacity to get into the garden where you can forget all that shame stuff. You can, you can get into play and display and not experience the sort of uh, discouraging eyes, the disapproving eyes that you get in other kind of spaces if you try to display yourself. See? Uh, you know. Think about the places in your life where you're able to be enthusiastic without running into that kind of shaming looks, without somebody meeting you with a kind of a pull back like that. Now, another capacity that this, that this particular potential in the psyche has is what I like to call, along with the, the great uh, uh, philosophical theologian Bernard Malin, appreciative consciousness. Uh, If you want to read somebody who's aware of this kind of perception and has talked about it in some depth, you want to read Norman Brown's work, particularly his books Life Against Death and Love's Body, in that he talks about eros and art, eros and language. Eros, you might even talk about it this way in terms of the contemporary uh, world of scholarship. You would talk about a whole erotic approach to interpretation in which you can appreciate that which you come to. You don't try to distance yourself from it. You're, trying, you're not into having depreciation be your first movement of interpretation. Uh, it's very interesting today. Uh, uh, a lot of the time when you, when, you, when you get into people who study literature, you know, what do we talk about, you know, the field in which you study literature? A lot of the time we talk about literary criticism, see, in which often a scholar's competence is determined on how much criticism of the text or of the narrative and so forth they can provide rather than their capacities for appreciation of an artistic creation. I mean, if you go into university departments, it's very interesting. A lot of people go into the study of literature expecting to be with a group of people who are appreciating epiphanies uh, of the soul. And what they find is a lot of people into literary dissection tables. You know, uh, and so, so this capacity is not this this archetypal configuration does not come at the world that way. Uh, you know, I've said that if that if you're coming out of the king and queen, if it moves, you you bless it. You want to nurture it. See, if you're coming out of the warrior, you want to fight it. If you're coming out of the magician, you want to interpret it. You want to understand it. See? When you're coming out of this one, you want to appreciate it. So it's a unique kind of, kind of consciousness. Uh, and it, it, to get a feeling for it, you, have to, you really have to get into reading, uh, uh, say, something like Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman. Or you have to get into something like the work of uh, William Blake and uh, look at Blake's paintings and read his poetry and get some sense about 
the way in which he felt that if you really were in touch with this kind of energy that the world becomes luminous for you. It's not just, you know, the world is not just vast expanses of darkness and depression and boredom with a few little hierophanies here and there, you know. Well, there's a hierophany over there, you know. Let's travel over there and see if we can build a little shrine to it. I mean, you kind of, kind of imagine that now, see. Think of the difference between the person that is living or, or really in touch with this kind of circuitry and the kind of experience of the world which views it as, as chiefly sort of dead and depressing and uh, an expanse of emotional desert uh, with a few oases here and there. It's a radically different kind of perception of the world. For someone who is into this kind of perception, fueled by connection with this kind of archetypal potential, the entire landscape tends to glisten. And this is a very interesting thing here. One of the ways to get at this and to test how you're doing with regard to this one is your sort of what I might call a boredom quotient. And that is to say, just kind of take a little take a little note. How much of the time in your life are you bored? If you find yourself bored very much of the time, you're out of touch with this particular configuration. See, it's very interesting. You can be bored and be a workaholic. We'll get into that a good bit later. Yeah. Yeah. Let me re let me restate your let me restate your 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 comment for the tape. He's saying that this sounds this sounds this appreciative consciousness sounds like the kind of wonderment that one has spontaneously as a child. And then he he raises the question about uh, how do you stay in touch with this? It's like he says, it's like uh, hearing a joke more than once that you kind of things become stale. There's a concept in uh, literary criticism that kind of talks about that. It's the concept of sedimentation, and there is a, it, it is a, is a treatment of human perception and human consciousness. That is to say, there is a tendency for us to to become enthusiastic about some experience, and then it tends to sort of go dead on us, and we can't find the enthusiasm for it anymore. And uh, uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot of thought, people have given a lot of thought to that sort of thing. Uh, I think that that's one of the reasons why people tend to romanticize childhood. You know, people will often come up to me when I'm lecturing on the lover, and they'll say, well, now, you know, you're really talking about the child within. And then they go into the spontaneity of the child or the natural child or the magical child and all that sort of thing. And sure, that's, this, that is the kind of energy that's being talked about here. But what is really sad is the way in which we are so cut off with the adult lover within that we project that onto the child and then envy the children. We envy the hell out of children because of their, they haven't been separated from that part of themselves yet. They haven't been shamed enough yet to, to learn how to be nice. See? And what I like to say to people is that there is nothing that a healthy child has that a healthy adult lover doesn't have in greater portion. That is to say, you can get into a hell of a lot more trouble as an adult than you can as a child. Think about it. I mean, there's a lot more varieties of trouble you can get into as an adult. So, I mean, why put all that envy on the children and then want to, if you envy the children that much, you'll make them want to take their toys away, you know. Uh, when, uh, when, as an adult, if you can get in touch with this energy and learn, we'll talk about, you know, getting to where you can stand it. 
Think about that now. I want you to think about that tonight. That's what, I, what, what you really got. The difference between somebody that's really getting into trouble with this thing. We'll talk about next week. And somebody that can really get into it and, and not burn up and go down in flame is being able to have the resources of personality to be able to stand it, to stand the intensity of it. See, it's one of the things that, that I like to work with people on when I'm doing uh, therapy and analysis with them. It's gradually helping them to be able to stand their excitement longer. I mean, we'll talk, remind me next week to talk about premature ejaculation. Because it's not just something that, that is a genital thing. You know, most of us who are out of touch with this thing and don't contain it well enough have emotional premature ejaculation a lot of the time. We are so afraid of the intensity that this archetypal configuration brings that we just defend against it like mad and make out like we don't even have it. You show me a man who feels kind of dead inside or wooden inside or kind of uh, like he has no passion, I'll show you a man that's defending like mad against the presence of this energy. His problem isn't that he doesn't have it. His problem is that he's afraid he's going to get in touch with it. And then he's going to run amok. See? Uh, so, uh, so this energy is, what, is the kind of energy and kind of openness and kind of enthusiasm and kind of shamelessness uh, that we envy in children. And uh, why we tend to give them a lot more toys than, uh, than they can effectively play with. Because uh, it's really our own shadow lover that uh, we're trying to get to in that business. Yeah, somebody had their hand up here. Yeah. yeah when you talked about, uh, one of the things you said, lover energy doesn't respect boundaries. Yes. You know, when Robert Fly tells the second part of that story, about the wild man, mm -hmm. and he talks, well, actually, it's the third part of the story, where he goes into the castle, and the second part, he gets into the, uh, the garden, mm -hmm. and he talks about the garden as being a place to set that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Could you just... Yeah. The question has to do with uh, the question of the garden being a place to set boundaries, and my comment that lover, en lover energy is not really a respecter of boundaries. You've got to understand that those stories are initiation stories. And when they're talking about the initiation, a man coming into his maturity, it's not talking about raw archetypal lover energy. See, if you're going to be able to deal with this energy as a mature man, you will have to be able to have boundaries, set boundaries. You'll have to put boundaries at the edge of the garden. You'll have to be able to protect the garden. This is what most people don't do. It's very difficult to find people who adequately protect the boundaries of the garden space in their lives. They let everything else encroach into it. You know, you'll find people all the time, you'll say, uh, you talk to them, I, I say something, well, when was the last time you went dancing? Oh, I know that we should go dancing. I say, yeah, I know that you know that we should go dancing, but when was the last time you went? You know, well, when's the next time you're going? Well, we just had that time. See? I mean, it's not intentional, right? Everything intrudes. But you really have to actively be strong enough to protect that space, and that means you really have to have strong warrior energy developed. If you don't have a strong warrior, you won't ever have the garden protected, and it will be spoiled by every other demand on you in your life. But you're talking about a mature man. Bly is talking about masculine initiation. He's talking about a man who's getting to the point where he can, he can be strong enough to be with this energy without it burning him up, without it killing him. I'm talking about the archetype. I'm talking about the, the stuff before the transformer. You know. 
Uh, and the reason people fear it, people don't fear it because they've got boundaries. People fear it because this thing wants to get into everything and everybody. Yeah. Miss, uh, getting into trouble, I'm wondering if you've done any uh, exploring of <clears throat> how many of the myths and fairy tales, including the biblical creation story, there is the aspect of disobedience. It seems like it's in so many of the fairy tales and myths that somewhere along the line there has to be disobedience. Uh, he's, he's raising the question about the connection with, with, uh, between this archetypal configuration, this energy, and all of these myths about disobedience. I think, it's a, I think it's a very interesting insight. Why is it that in so much mythology, for example, I'm working on a course now on the mythology of Satan. Why is it that Lucifer is the one that tends to be seen as having the fun? If you'll study the mythology of Satan uh, in the history of the Christian West, he tends to be associated with, with all the naughty things that are fun. You know, uh, uh, Lucifer doesn't get in trouble for, for things that uh, are nice. He's always rule breaker. It's no accident that the trickster archetype is associated with the satanic and that both of those things are associated with rule breaking. So it's a really interesting point. Now, but what we got to get at is, well, now what is that? What is that, uh, that energy in the lover that, that people will look at? See, if you're looking at it from the point of view of the king, now what's the king about? Well, they're about order, just order. But if you're just purely into that king, you don't want anybody messing up this great cosmic mandala you've made right you're up there you get to come let me have my cosmic mandala here ever a play everything in its place and a place for everything we're going to bless them all you know and uh the king is just not into this uh into this irresponsibility business you know i mean uh uh, the, the queens, you know, same way. Uh, not now, honey. I'm taking care of the children. You know, it's the same kind of thing. Not now, honey. I'm busy earning a living. You know, for the realm. See, and the same thing's true about the warrior. See, I mean, the warrior. If you're coming out of that warrior, you're on a mission, and you don't like anybody that's stopping off for R and R. <laughs> Come on, Jack. We got work to do. No stragglers. No stragglers, yeah. So, so it, it, you can really see once you start looking at the different archetypal configurations. Look, these things are not friendly to each other. That's why you got to get clear that the different archetypal configurations in your psyche don't—they don't particularly like each other naturally. So your job is to do, as I told you before, you know, your job is, job is to do a little cosmic or psychological uh, family therapy in here. You have to kind of help them relate to each other because they really don't like each other. This energy is just sort of anarchic. You know, the anarchists kind of into this. And, uh, uh, you know, nickel love and free beer. Something like that. I can't. <laughs> yeah. Thinking about beer in my <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, no keg tonight. Permitted disobedience. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking about we're in Loyola Catholic Church and in the Papa and the permitted disobedience for this Catholic is to go get a beer and get drunk. Well, you know, uh, there, he's saying that, that, that in some communities, and he, he thinks maybe in the Roman uh, uh, Catholic community, that one of the permitted disobediences may be to, to, to get a beer or have a drink. Well, you know, it's interesting. In the traditional orders, think about the way traditional cultures handled this. They all handled it something like this, except a little more elaborately, right? What about Mardi Gras? You know what Mardi Gras is? Mardi Gras is the space of the lover. It's real interesting, though, in traditional cultures, it wasn't just Mardi Gras. It was more like one of these black conferences when you have 
what what Michael Mead Michael Mead loves uh, carnival. You know, you have carnival, that means all hell breaks loose, and you know anything goes. And uh, if you want to learn about shamelessness, you just go to a black conference and show up on Carnival. Uh, sorry about that, Michael. Uh, but anyway, so, but that's not, the, Bly didn't make that up, you know. Michael Mead and Bly didn't get together and cook up Carnival. That is an ancient cultural form and cross-culturally. And what they did was they knew that this energy had to have be honored. You know, we, have, we say, have this saying, give the devil his due. Well, in the old days, they, they, they give all of them their due. You know, we'll have, we'll have, a, we'll have a certain a ritualized period of time when uh, this thing can come out and be honored. And nobody's going to be shamed about what they do during carnival. You can be shamed about what you do right up before it, and you can be shamed about what you do right after it, but whatever you do during it, you're not shamed for it, see? You need to look at that. Look at the cross-cultural expression of that. That isn't just in one culture. That's not just New Orleans, folks. I mean, some of my New Orleans friends would... Uh, some, of my, some of my New Orleans friends would like to believe it, like you to believe that's a Cajun tradition. But, uh, but it's wider than that. Well, he says, he says, is that like the office Christmas party? Well, it's the same space. That is to say, that is the same psychic space that, that starts trying to creep in. And, uh, and it's the same. You, once you understand these spaces, you begin to recognize them when you see them. It comes up there. It comes up at Carnival. It comes up at rock concerts. St. Patrick's Day in Chicago. That's right. Uh, so so this, is a, this is a space which, uh, which human beings have known about, and they've tried various ways of ritualizing it and integrating it. See, one of the things that uh, shows you how hard this particular configuration is to get into any kind of mature, integrated form is the ubiquity of the, the institution of prostitution throughout history. Uh, there's this book called The, uh, the Sacred Prostitute that you may want to look at, which kind of gets at some of the, the historical sacred spaces are in, this, in this area uh, throughout, throughout history. And uh, uh, you, you want to just look at that stuff anthropologically and just see in that how difficult this energy is to integrate, but how reluctant human beings are to say goodbye to it. I mean, they will pay a lot of money to stay in touch with this space. And, uh, and they will find sort of sneaky, tricksterish, hermetic ways to stay in touch with it and still make out like they're nice. You know, that's what Jungians like to talk about, persona and shadow. Well, there are a lot of folks that don't know anything about persona and shadow, but they, but they arrange their lives around the persona and then they, they make sure they have ways of acting out their shadow in a trickster ways, you know, uh, to stay in touch with the space. And all, all I want to say as a Jungian analyst here is that, hey, look, let's just get clear about this energy. Number one, people aren't going to turn loose of it completely. And number two, it must be important. We need to think about why. And number three, we ought to be able to do better at bringing this energy into our lives than we have up to now as human, as a, as a species. Uh, but you can get a little feel for it. Uh, other comments before we take a break? We've, yes. Um, Someone sounds like uh, the solution of having fun or something. Um, isn't there a different form of love? When you mentioned earlier about the key and having his order and term for people, isn't he... Uh, Yes, he is. After the break, I'm going to talk about the way in which this energy functions when it's functioning appropriately in the other uh, archetypal structures. I'm going to talk about necrophilia, you see. Uh, what you get, and we'll get into this after the break, what you get in all these different structures, if you don't have a connection with this archetypal energy, is you get a sort of a, 
a necrophiliac approach in all these other areas. Sort of a love of death approach in the other areas. And uh, this energy is essential. Your point is well taken. That is to say, uh, this energy is, it has got enormous positive benefits. But what you've got to make a distinction about, you've got to distinguish between the pure energy and its, its appropriate mediation and balance with these other forms. See, some of you are persons that have never really consciously gotten yourself into trouble with this energy. See. But others of you in this room have been shooting up with this thing. <laughs> and uh and, and it has gotten you into you you you've been real good at it, getting in trouble. Uh and you know about the power and of attractiveness of this thing, but you also know the way in which it it really does dissolve your life in a way. So we will we'll get into some of the ways in which you can see it that it 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 sort of imbuing these other configurations with a certain humanness after the break. Uh, other coming, yeah. Would you see it as sort of the archetype of drug induced activity generally? I mean, when you say sex, drugs, and rock and roll? Yes, I think, I think when you get into a sort of a sacramental use of substances, mm -hmm. whether it's wild turkey or mescaline or whatever, uh, this is what's operating. Now, it can be, you see, there are different ways, and after the break, we'll talk about the sort of the magus lover, the magician lover. Now, that's the one that's going to probably get more into fine-tuning all the substance abuse. <laughs> well, let's see. Let's go down to the lab and see what else we can come up with. You know, you know the drugstore cowboy, woo. Uh, but... But but that's an. I really think this. I wasn't joking. This is the archetype of configuration uh, underlying this kind of uh, uh, passionate burning up with uh, substances and music and uh, and sexuality. But help me here a bit. Okay. Historically, let's say, say the prostitution you mentioned, the historical sacred and other. This. Isn't it sometimes people who are possessed by, let's say, the king archetypes who manipulate those circumstances in order to control their population? Oh, certainly. The question is, uh, isn't, uh, in, in terms of, say, something like prostitution, isn't it someone that's in the king archetype or one of the other archetypal configurations that manipulates people uh, uh, in that kind of uh, life? Absolutely. But see, what we've got to look at is projection, mm -hmm. uh, mergers, psychological mergers, uh, psychological using people for receptacles for our projected contents, sadomasochism. Next week we'll talk about sadomasochism and the way in which in contemporary psychoanalysis we talk about this as self-object relationships and how we use other persons to complete us. Uh, there are a lot of people who are consciously out of touch with this configuration, who are compulsively connected with somebody else that's mainlining it. Mm -hmm. See? Uh, uh, you're talking about the pimp who's impotent, see? Who, has a, who runs a, a large group of prostitutes, see? The Muslim emperor who gives yeah. the bread and circuses to keep the mobs quiet. Yes, yes. So you got to understand that these these energies very seldom get balanced in an individual. When Jung talks about individuation, that's he's talking about something that's hard to attain, enormously difficult kind of balancing that can develop in a in a mature personality. If you're not to that point, then you're either really dealing with one or more of these configurations and projecting it, splitting it off on someone else, letting someone else carry it. Uh, so we'll talk about that in, some, in terms of the pathological forms next week. Any other comment before we take a break? Yes, back here. I think that 
seems like to me because it is it's supposed to be out of control so that in itself would scare people from becoming in touch with it so like you're in this um catch 22 about the whole thing and so maybe that you know how does it take the balancing of all those cells in order for someone to really be able to contain it well, she's asking, uh, does it take a kind of a balancing of all these different configurations for a person to contain it? Uh, I think optimally that's the only way it will be contained consciously. See, a lot of the time we'll see uh, in relationships, for example, say in a couple, one or the other person in the couple will usually carry the lover for the couple. See? And that's not really what ought to be happening in a couple. Both of them ought to be sharing the responsibility for, for stewarding the garden. But, but most couples, that's not the case. In most couples, one or the other gets unconsciously assigned the responsibility for taking care of the garden space. And one of the things that has to happen in good marital therapy is, is stopping that, you know, getting both of them to take some stewardship of the garden space in, in their life. So, uh, so it's not easy uh, to contain it consciously. It gets contained unconsciously by letting some relationship, some, you know, a lot of people keep dangerous friends. You got any dangerous friends? Think about your dangerous friends. Now, your dangerous friends contain this energy for you. You know. And it's a projection, uh, and, and, and the partnership between you and the dangerous friend is that they, they will carry this energy for you, and you will carry some more calm, centered energy for them, and the two of you together will sort of make up a sort of a hermaphroditic union. It looks like a, it looks like a whole, but it isn't really. And that's right. She's saying that, uh, that she's emphasizing the, the, the fear of getting in touch with this because of the possibility of being overwhelmed about it. I think that she's right. I think you're right about that. And it is a danger. And uh, it's more dangerous to the extent that one has tried to deny the power of this thing in the unconscious. And this is what happens in so-called midlife crises, largely with men, see. Yeah. That's when it's really coming up, and yeah. that's when it's really held down. And so yeah. maybe you know, if it could come out more at that time, then it wouldn't be continuing to be suppressed after that. It could out inappropriately later on. And the, refle the reflection she's making is the importance of having an adolescence where this energy is at least allowed some play. And if you had an adolescence where in uh, uh, it's uh, less so today than it was in the 50s. Can you imagine what it was like when Elvis and Jerry Lee Lewis came along? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, can you imagine what, uh, you know, you got to get back and watch some of those, those films where they're trying to recreate what mom and dad thought when Jerry Lee came on the stage, you know. Try the 40s uh, or 30s. Yeah, uh, yeah, right. Back further than the 50s, uh, the 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 repression of this energy in adolescence was amazing. It's much less now. In fact, uh, uh, there are a lot of kids today who don't have enough help containing it by their families. Uh, but, but your point is well taken. I mean, this, this stuff is so powerful that if it's allowed to go into the unconscious sort of fully uh, in late adolescence, uh, then it will come back with, as Jung would point out, it comes back with, the repressed always returns, the Freudians say. And it's true. And it will come out with a vengeance and often come out in forms that are hard to recognize as lover energy. For, well, for example, uh, we'll get into it next week. Uh, if you tend to have a problem overeating, that's lover energy coming out. Uh, you know, you know, I once saw somebody that had a, had a bumper sticker, something like, uh, uh, something about fat people make better lovers. Well, in a way, in a way, fat people are more in touch with this. It's in a certain form, 
but it's a raw kind of uh, lover energy that they indeed are in touch with. It's not integrated like uh, Marion Woodman would like for it to be. But uh, but a number of analysts, uh, uh, a number number of analysts working on uh, eating disorders, have noted and addictions have noted that they think that this is lover problems. This is lover difficulties. And I think we'll talk about that a lot more next week. I think that's true. And uh, you know, it kind of helped you a little bit if you thought, you know, if you if you're if you're having trouble with alcoholism or drug abuse or overeating or something, if you just kind of say to yourself, hmm, hmm, this is this, this is because I got so much of this lover energy in me. You might look at yourself a little differently. You might feel a little differently about yourself, and you might you might reframe your problem a little, and have a little have a little different way of thinking about yourself. It's not that I'm too much out of touch with my love. Uh, I may have to kind of learn to contain this and channel it in other things that don't hurt me so much. But I think you ought to think about that a little bit. Yeah, well, not <laughs> basket weaving. Well, I think maybe uh, he laughs about basket weaving, but you know... Uh, uh, there are a lot of people who really uh, who really have a lot of erotic energy in their artwork, including folk arts, basket weaving, and weaving of various kinds. I mean, you don't want to get too, to think that's too funny because uh, there's a real erotic side to the to the folk arts. And so, let's take our break now and come back in about. I said we'd talk a little bit about necrophilia. Uh, you know. The uh, the Freudians used to have a real sense uh, back in the classical days of uh, what Freud called thanatos. That is the uh, what he called the death instinct. Freud saw the the tension between eros, love, which he would consider a life instinct, libido, a life force. And Thanatos, sort of a, a, a movement toward death. <clears throat> and uh, he tended to view sadism uh, and masochism as expressions uh, of, of erotic connections in which there was too much of this sort of uh, love of death, dr death drive, death energy, death instinct uh, in it. Now we can look at what qualities someone who is trying to uh, manifest king energy. You know, I've I have uh, enjoyed telling people to look at the uh, movie King David, in which you get this this distinction, this comparison between David, who was really a lover before he was a king, uh, and Saul, who was really unable to return the love that David had for him. And what you see in this king energy, anytime the king energy comes online, when there's not enough of this, this lover stuff, the lover values the lover energy sees the value of. It is capable of, of, uh, of adoring and capable of, of uh, <clears throat> seeing the innate worth in something, wanting to lift it up and exalt it. And when you have the king energy, or if you're in a king position and you don't have enough of this lover stuff, then you will tend to want to dominate without any concern for the innate worth of that which you are uh, in charge of. And so here you get without the lover energy, emanating through this king configuration, what do you get? Well, you get a king who cannot bless, right? Think about it. 
because the king without this energy has no heart. There is no heart of blessing in the king if he's not in touch with this energy. Yes. She's mentioning Henry V. Uh, and uh, in that you get an interesting struggle. I mean, that's a very subtle play, uh, Henry V, and, and it's subtly done in that movie. And you look at it, what you see in that is a lot of struggle about narcissistic wounding. <coughs> An attempt to triumph over narcissistic wounding, get restoration of one's sense of self-esteem. Uh, one of the things they say about narcissistic personality disorders, and we'll talk about this more next week, is they can't love. We, and I've talked about the, uh, the pathology of the king energy in, in someone. Uh, it's, it's a king energy that cannot love, cannot care for. A king, without this kind of energy permeating him, will not be able to care in a stewarding way. You don't steward things you don't value, right? You only steward those things which have worth. Otherwise, it's just a job, right? One that, take, that tires you out, you know? Uh, and one that you are bored with. See, boredom always comes in when this energy is not really in place. So, uh, <clears throat> so the king, without this, no sense of the value of things in the realm, boredom with the responsibilities, very little enthusiasm for it, see? Very little sense of the capacity to cherish and care for and to empower those uh, uh, under his care. Yeah, Steve. It almost sounds like you're saying that the king is the integration of the other three archetypes. Well, in, in the highest sense, I think that's why you know, he's saying that it's like I'm saying that the king is the integration of the other archetypes. The, the fullness of the king that you see in, uh, in sacral kingship would be that. That is to say, that's why the gods in history, the gods have been represented as kings. The gods in their fullness can be fully, can fully manifest all of these four energies. But the pure energy of the archetype without the other archetypes is always one-sided. It's always flat. And it always tends toward the pathological. See, that's what you got to understand about archetypes. This is why I, I really appreciate Gene Boland's work. It's excellent work. It's the best stuff I've seen in helping people delineate these different patterns. But the problem that you have if you go Boland's way is that every god is a personality. It may be a little one-sided, but it's a personality, and if you're a personality, you carry more than one archetypal energy. An archetypal configuration is not a personality. It's an energy. It's an energy field and configuration. It is one-sided. It is not a person. And so to the extent that a god has a personality, or a goddess, or a human has a personality, they are embodying a balance, more or less, of these archetypal configurations. And so if you're talking about King David, it's no accident that King David has held endless fascination for people throughout history, because in some real ways, he did integrate a lot of these masculine energies. I like to say that David, you know, if uh, Jung talked about Christ as the archetype of the self, of the archetypal self, of the male self, and so forth. Well, in some ways, King David is a far more adequate picture of the fullness of the male self than Jesus, as he's portrayed in the Gospels. Jesus portrays a lot of different aspects but he sure doesn't have the lusty sexuality that is a part of the mature male personality. You got a mature male personality, you got a lusty sexuality. 
And that's David, not Jesus. See? At least the Jesus of the Gospels. Now you get into the nasty Gospels. <laughs> Baby, you chopped the wood and I'm there. Yeah. <laughs> It may be a little different story in the Gnostic Gospels. That may be why they got kind of repressed. But uh, <laughs> but anyway, so when you study King David, you watch the movie David, you really see the king who's, who's in touch with a lot of this lover energy. It's one of the things, I, I, I kind of was sick when I first realized that they chose Richard Gere to play that part. But then as I watched that movie several times, I got to thinking, yeah, that makes more sense than I thought. It may be a lousy movie, but it has a good sense of, the, of this archetypal configuration because uh, Gear has a way of, uh, of, of communicating some of this kind of crazy lover stuff. Uh, did you see the movie Breathless? If you want to get a little of that crazy lover energy, what uh, Gene Bolin would talk about kind of identify with the Aries personality. Not the, Dion the nice boy Dionysius personality, you know, kind of the dreamy lover, but in Breathless, it's sort of the Aries sort of uh, power lover, you know, side. And you catch that a lot in the movie King David. So take a look at that uh, this week. But anyway, let's get into the warrior now. See, the warrior... Without, without much of this lover energy, you get into the, <clears throat> the coldly efficient killer. And if you want to see the image of the warrior archetype without the lover, get the movie Terminator. Because there's Arnold Schwarzenegger, the Warrior archetype, sans lover. Killing machine is going to carry out its mission. It doesn't care if it brings the world to an end. It hates all things human. Human things simply are too messy. See the movie, you see that. It just can't. The machines, the machines decided they'd take over the world. Because, in, in fact, what they were getting at, there's too much of this lover archetype crap in humans. Always messing things up. So we, we machines will take over and we'll clean it up and it will work right. The trains will run on time. You know. Huh? Switzerland. <laughs> Switzerland, don't say that. Oh, some of the unions will have a fit if you say that. <laughs> But anyway, so just look at that movie if you want to see The Warrior Without the Lover. Uh, and it's real interesting. Uh, that whole movie deals with sort of the messianic redeemer motif, the birth of the redeemer. And it's no accident that what the Terminator wants to kill in that movie is sort of the little Christ figure, who, of course, is the messianic lover king that's going to come and redeem the world from the machines. So you can think about that. It's, it's sort of a campy movie in a way, but if you think about it in terms of the arms race, maybe it's not such a joke because there are a lot of folks on this earth that function a little bit like uh, that figure in, uh, in The Terminator. And they have so little a feel for the value of human life that pulling the trigger is not a problem. You know, uh, for a man that hadn't got enough of that warrior energy, he can't ever pull the trigger. He's going to study it some more. You know? Uh, you know? There are a lot of situations in which we ought to be able to pull the trigger. But uh, but in this place where the warrior archetype is dominant and there's very little lover, they love pulling the trigger. If it moves and it has any life in it, we want to kill it. 
And uh, there's where, you know, Bolin talks, uh, Gene Bolin talks in a very interesting way. Read that chapter on Ares in Bolin's book, Gods and Every Man. <clears throat> because she's got a feeling for the way in which even after the warrior begins to get a little lover energy, and it's not getting it directly, it's not getting it direct, it's seeping in. Coming in, the lover energy comes in through the warrior. And when the lover energy comes in through the warrior, the underside, then you get a real love of killing. Then you get the individual of which there are many in this world that love to watch you while they kill you. I mean, you know, it's not a nice sight to see. The classical Freudians used to be real real interested in trying to make us see the extent to which uh, the sadist uh, is a powerful human reality. Uh, most of us turn away from that, but, but when you get a sadist, you get somebody whose experience of the lover comes through the warrior in a sort of a pathological way. It's not gotten to the point where they can value the other very much, but they've got enough of that lover energy in seeping in through the warrior that they enjoy the killing. And they enjoy the torture. I mean, if you, if you talk to people that know about torture, you know, torture is a very widespread thing on the planet. And it's very interesting. Uh, uh, you let <clears throat> a bunch of men get in a place where they have total power over other men or women. And this shadow thing comes out. And it is a not pretty thing. And they get erotic gratification out of inflicting pain. Now, that's something that exists. And it exists a lot more than we'd like to think of. And what's going on there is when this, when this lover energy has not been given its own space in life, if it doesn't have its own space that's carefully protected in your life, it will start moving into the other spaces in a shadow way. It's very interesting the way that works. Uh, so you start getting the the presence of sadomasochism, which we'll get into more next week. So, uh, but with, now let's talk about the positive side of this thing, see. When you get the warrior energy in a personality that's got a lot of this lover, then you will fight for something. You're not just killing to be killing. You're not just fighting just to scratch your warrior itch, you know. You, you, are, you have a sense of the value of human life and you're willing to do something about it. Now, see, it's very interesting today. Uh, there are enormous numbers of things that need to be done because of the value of people and forest and oceans, and all sorts of things. But we either don't have any warrior energy, or the warrior energy we've got is not infused with enough of the capacities of the lover so that you get those things operating together so that there is a fighting on behalf of things of value. Hmm? It's, it's the, when you get a person who has got a real sense of value, the lover is online. This is what makes a rainbow warrior a la rainbow warriors in Greenpeace. Your ecology types are loaded with those two energies. Your, your, your e ecological activist, I'm not talking about the ones that talk about it. I'm talking about those guys and, and, and those women in Greenpeace 
<clears throat> they go out there and they take on those that are poisoning the world head on. And what's the name of that other group that's even more radical? Well, there's another, there's another group of ecologists who are even more radical than the Greenpeace types. Uh, the Green Party. No, no, there, I'll, I'll think of it and try to mention it next time. But anyway, you're right. It, this is the person that has enough of a sense of the value of the ecosystems of the earth and who are willing to fight for it. And so uh, <clears throat> it's really at the heart of every true knighthood tradition on earth. Every culture has every traditional culture has a knighthood tradition. And in terms of the male psyche, you could talk about this in the female psyche. I think it's there in the female psyche too. But in terms of the male psyche, up until modernity, you had a clear representation of the warrior who understood value. And you see it most clearly in the medieval traditions around chivalry. And those people today who want to make fun of that don't even understand what they're seeing. Because when you get a warrior energy that has no sense of honor and has no sense of a code of ethics and values, then you've got a Terminator. And you've got somebody that will be a good soldier at my lie and kill women and children without batting an eye and think that that means they're being a good warrior. That's a soldier, folks. That's not a warrior. So a, a warrior in terms of traditional culture, and every tribe had an understanding of this, was someone who knew what value was, the value of life, and was willing to fight for it. It's hard to find that in the modern world. It's hard to find that. But it's not dead. There are a lot of people, yeah. I have trouble as a student of ethnocentrism after what the last Bible did. Tribes next to each other who derogate one another. Oh, yes. Who make themselves less than human. That's the meaning of tribalism. Right. And so, uh, when I think about me lot, I think they're all soldiers, family. That is, we're built in, in a sense, to derogate and take away the humanity of those with whom we're fighting. That's the combat myth. He's saying that, he's, that he sees as a study of ethnocentrism and tribalism that that tends to be something that's built in in the history of the human race. I think that's clear. You study history and you see that that's what tribalism does. But you see, you've got to understand what tribalism is. Every tribe exists in a little cosmos. It's a microcosmos. And you have to understand that archetypally, that is their world. Now, we ought to be able to do better than that. I mean, the challenge of our age is to get beyond tribalism. For the first time in history, we have, a, we have a chance to do that. But the archetypal structures are still there, which make the warrior comes up, the enemy comes up. And it tends to get projected on the other race or the other sex or the other uh, uh, nation. But see, the problem is, and if, and if you, I don't know, you, You've, uh, in my lectures on the warrior, I point out that there really are enemies of the human race. Anybody that doesn't see that there are not enemies of the human race needs more warrior energy. Because one of the pathologies of the warrior archetype is when, when there's a real enemy and you can't see it. Uh, the planet is in a great deal of trouble and there are, true, there are real enemies of the planet and enemies of the human race. They're enemies of the children in this city. And they're... <clears throat> so you've got to be able to be able to have some sense of what the real enemy is and what it is that's worth fighting for. And uh, part of the 
what it has meant to be a man in tribal culture was to fight for the, for the best values that you know about. And that's a problem for men today. Men have a real difficulty with that. Yes. He's saying, uh, is Malai a problem of the lover of the king? Well, see, it's, uh, when you're talking about mature personality, uh, whenever you have a failure like that, it's a failure in all of these configurations in a sense. But you know, if you're in connection enough with this type of thing, this type of energy we're talking about in this course, you're not going to be a good soldier and make out like life is not of value so quickly. You're not going to be able to ram shovels up the vaginas of women, no matter what race they are, if you've got enough feel for this thing in a healthy way. You're just not going to get off on that. And uh, when you see people who can actually do that, I mean, you need to study the accounts of the Vietnam War by people that were there, people that participated in a lot of things. Not just the Vietnam War, all these wars. There's something that happens with people that are very narcissistically wounded and have been abused, which is most of us, that when given a chance, when you got a lot of firepower, you will abuse those who you have power over. And that's a wounded lover that will do that. It's the wounded lover who is an abuser. And so uh, I don't disagree with your point about not enough good king stuff there. I mean, you could use LBJ for a textbook on the Shadow King. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> let me talk a little bit about the magician. What time is it? Okay. Let me talk a little bit about the magician without the lover energy. <clears throat> you know, the magician is the most introverted of archetypal configurations. <clears throat> but when it doesn't have enough connection with the lover stuff, it's just plain downright detached. It, when you're into the magician and you don't have enough of this lover energy, you just don't feel connected. And at the same, at the same time that you don't feel connected with the other, you don't really feel anything of their value. And they're not very interesting either. So imagine, this is the, the magician, you know, I've said to you many times, is the archetype of the therapist. Now imagine the therapist who is not closely enough connected with the lover energy, directly and consciously. Now think about, it. what will they be like? Hmm? Say, say it again. The rapist. The rapist. <laughs> And you got to think about what that, what that connotes in all sorts of forms. What, what it will be, uh, the therapist will be real interested in diagnosis. Think about it. I mean, uh, there are good reasons to be good at diagnosis. If you've got a lot of this magus energy in you, you're going to want to be a diagnostician, you know. If it moves, I'm going to diagnose it. Let's see, what is that? That's DSM-3R300.40. <laughs> but the point of it is, is that you will get into dissecting, you'll know what the pathology of this person is, and you'll be so clear, well, this is really a borderline, a very, very disturbed borderline. So let's refer him for medication. See? He's not going to get better. <laughs> It's like when, when you have a person entering therapy, and there are many that get into the field out of the magus archetype. You know, the magus archetype doesn't make you a healer. That's the, that's the dumb fantasy some people have. You got a lot of magus archetype makes you a shaman. You know, if you just got this stuff, it's I'm a shaman, right? <laughs> well, the, the magus is not a shaman. 
the magus archetype doesn't make you a shaman. It just makes you in this pattern. Makes you want to know, makes you want to interpret. It doesn't necessarily make you want to heal. It's the lover energy in someone who is into this pattern that makes them care enough to want to be a healer. And you can look at that. It's like, you know, there are even people that will train you to be a therapist that will tell you, and they'll tell you this with a straight face. Oh, you shouldn't want to cure them. You don't want to be too invested in them getting better. It's not professional. <laughs> not profitable, he says. <clears throat> there are a lot of people that are training supervisors in schools of analysis and psychotherapy that really will sit there with a straight face and you're going over your case with you and if you look too concerned about the person, they'll scold you for it. See, And they have the best of reasons. They give you a hundred great reasons about your counter-transference, this and the, you know, overstimulating of the patient, that and all that sort of thing. But you look at it in this context of this configuration, a lot of people go into therapy because they have trouble with relationships. I mean, become therapist. Look at Alan Wheelis's book, The Quest for Identity. Look at Alice Miller's work. Uh, drama of the Gifted Child, in which she talks about her work doing therapy with therapists. And they all tend to be people that have been wounded narcissistically and have trouble loving. So if you get into this magus archetype and you don't have enough connection consciously with this lover energy, then it will make you perhaps a good scientific <laughs> psychologist, quote unquote. Maybe even a really great diagnostician. You can pigeonhole people with the best. But in terms of making the kind of connections, empathic connections that today in self-psychology we know is the key to helping someone get better, you will flunk empathy. Because without the connection with this lover business, you can't feel your way in. The, the, the empathy is a capacity to feel your way inside the experiencing of the person. And that's where that disrespect for boundaries, see that, look at that. It's a, it's a kind of disrespect for boundaries, the, the boundary between me and you, but it enables me to get into your feelings and feel what it's like in there. See, If I have enough ethics that I don't abuse that trust, that lover in the magus can make you a shaman. See, it's the shaman. It's very interesting to study shamanism in the light of all this because the shaman, back to your point, back here about the king energy, see, it's that shaman healer who combines all these energies in a material way for healing. They've got the sacrificial willingness of the king. They've got the centeredness of the king. They've got the interest in just order, right order of the king. They've got the courage of the warrior, the willingness to fight the disease entities. Read Castaneda. He's got that stuff down about that. But, but most of all, it's got that capacity to care enough to suffer with someone which healing, being a healer, requires. So you really can see how without this lover energy, all of the powers of the other forms become one-sided and they don't really serve life. They get into serving, uh, serving death in various forms, exploitation, abuse, becomes abusive. See. So uh, this energy, while in its raw forms it looks so scary, and is kind of scary, uh, without it, you really do become a sort of a caricature of a human being uh, in all of your functioning. And to top it off, you don't have any fun. 
Okay. Now, let me stop there, and uh, we've got about five minutes. Let me open it up for any comments or questions. Yeah. Remember, next th next time we're going to get a lot more into the pathology of the lover. Yeah. Okay. Um, my question is, uh, you mentioned about the um, use of personality to describe a lover. Being wounded in this lover configuration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, uh, in my way of thinking, uh, a lot of the reason why these people are like this are because they had a lack of love. Or love, love yeah, them. right. Um, and oftentimes I get a solution between just to love yourself. Uh, how does one love oneself? Easy question. <laughs> question. He says that he, he noticed this, that, uh, that a lot of people have been abused or have... Uh, have uh, have really not had any uh, experiences of love in the home and uh, that they'll say that the solution is to learn to love yourself and how do you do that? <clears throat> well, sure it's important to be able to love yourself and one of the things that when you connect with this thing in a, in a positive way, you do. Uh, uh, you begin to not be so ashamed of yourself. You do like uh, Bernie Siegel says and you get out and you take your clothes off in front of a mirror and you say, there! <laughs> I love you. You know. So. Hmm. Start buggy for. I'm serious. You ought to do that and see what happens. You know, take your clothes off tonight in front of the mirror. Get in there and just stay there. Don't 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 indulge your shame. You know, just be in there in front of the mirror. Uh, and that's right, you do get to learn to love yourself, but the thing about it is, is look at that shame issue. Just think about shame a lot before next week. Think about shame. Because, see, shame separates you from people. The more shame stuff you got, you know, it's a defense against the sense of your own beauty. And so, and so when you got the shame, you, you, can't let, you can't even let yourself see your beauty, right? Much less anybody else. And even the thought of being beautiful, especially if you're a man, it sort of makes you feel funny. You kind of have to get away from that. You can be all kinds of things, but not beautiful, or not uh, luminous in some way. But you see, you get into a sense of this configuration, and it helps you knock the shame in the head. You know, it's like you declare no quarter with your shame. And you start learning a little bit about being shameless. I think that's what Robert Bly is talking about, is getting a little bit, getting the capacity to be a little bit shameless sometimes on behalf of yourself. And you're, and re rediscovering what Norman Brown calls love's body. Uh, yeah. On, like, if you have on the fourth, uh, enduring ecstasy and Lord of the Dance. Yeah. The enduring ecstasy thing I'll talk about a lot more next week. And I really want you to think about the, the, one of the most interesting discovery. I call it discovery because it's so fresh. The insights that they have are so fresh that I think it's almost fair to call it a discovery of the self-psychologist. Psychoanalytic self psychologists talk a lot. They have this really wonderful sense of being overstimulated. How, what happens when you get overstimulated? And this week, I want you to think about think about when you get overstimulated. See, when you get you can always tell when you get overstimulated. You start getting a little crazy. That's when you get your migraines. That's when you can't sleep at night. That's when you start overeating. That's when you. That's when the trickster gets to you. Uh, but you got to get a little feel for what this being overstimulated is. What is that anyway? Well, that's ecstasy trying to sneak into your life. You know, you haven't made any room for it. So you're lying there, and you you three o'clock in the morning, you wake up. Mm. <laughs> And, and you think, oh, my God, you know, I must be getting the flu or something like that, you know. You may just need to make love. It doesn't occur to you. Hey, when was the last time I had sex? You know? You know? Now, some of you get up and go down and get a drink. 
right? When you got to think about all this stuff, it, it, there, there, there is some wonderful. Uh, I'll try to remember to bring you the title of some some uh, literature next week on this. But the self psychologists have a way of thinking about addictions. That if you put it in the context of what we're talking about, you can really get a feel for the for the addictions because you get overstimulated. You get you get a little intensity. The intensity starts to build, and you can't stand it. You got to do something to deal with the intensity, and so you split off in some way. Well, what we got to do is to have you work on staying with the intensity longer. See, getting to where you can endure the intensity, endure the ecstasy longer. That's what is the goal. And it, it sounds easy. But when you're working with somebody on this in healing, trying to work on it in therapy, it takes you've got to work very carefully in helping them understand that when they when they split off into their boredom, maybe they're not as bored as they think. Maybe their boredom is a defense against the intensity. So, yeah. Robert, when, when I think of being overstimulated, I think of uh, working too much, too many demands. I don't think of it as that. Right, absolutely. Uh, he says when he thinks about being overstimulated, it's more in the realm of work. Uh, he's a good workaholic like me. Uh, and, but you know, it's, we workaholics. We're a little addictive too on that stuff, see? And we're bootlegging some of our passion and our intensity through the work. There's a sense, let's face it, you know, let's say, you know, like Sammy Davis Jr., I was talking about, his, he was being interviewed by Arsenio Hall the other night, and he was sitting there talking, and said, well, you know, this, the, the answer is, you know, we talk about all this stuff, addictions and everything, he says, well, you know, the secret is, I just love to drink. <laughs> I loved him when I heard him say that, you know, right, okay, here's one person that just loves to drink. It's not denying any of the rap on, uh, you know, allergic to this or allergic to that or tendency to this, and, but just love to drink. Now, that is also in somebody that loves to work. And you'll love to work up to a certain point. You really get off on your work to a certain point, but you get hooked on it to the point that it drives, it just drives you and drives you, and then it starts bleaching you out. We workaholics. I mean, you can't tell anybody we don't love what we're doing in some ways, but then it gets you bleached out, dries you out. See? So we got to kind of get a feel for that ecstatic side to that, which is addictive. Why is it addictive? Because it puts you in touch with this ecstasy stuff. See? You got to learn to get it more directly. See? Uh, so this week, I want you to think about... Uh, uh, when you're looking at some of these uh, lover movies and so forth, if you didn't get to see Zorba, look at Zorba. I looked at it again this week. It's really got a lot of this lover stuff in it. But look, think about yourself when you get overstimulated. What do you do? Notice when you shut down. Whenever you start shutting down and splitting off, you're getting overstimulated and you're having an emotional premature ejaculation, guys. So when we talk about healing the lover, you got to get to where you can stand more intensity without splitting off. So uh, meditate on that a little bit. I'll stick around a few minutes. I'll see you next week, and we'll talk about the shadow lover. Are you interested in knowing if you embody the essence of the lover in his fullness? Or if you are influenced by its more shadowy aspects? Why not take the Masculine Archetypes test? It's absolutely free and can guide you on a path of self-exploration. By gaining a deeper understanding of your masculine energies, you'll uncover your strengths and identify areas where you can grow. Don't miss out on this opportunity to embark on a journey of self-discovery. Take the Masculine Test today at www.masculinetest.com.